Mr. Bailey, would you please give us your full name and DOC number? David Glenn Berry, 378050. Thank you. Mr. Berry, let me explain our procedure to you. First, I'm going to read some information into the record, and then we're going to conduct a pardon interview with you. At the appropriate time, we will allow those persons who've indicated they have a willingness to have input in the case uh, to speak. Uh, currently, uh, uh, speaking on your behalf is Mr. Bobby Wallace, who is a friend, Norris Henderson, who is with First 72, Carrie Myers, who is with the Louisiana Parole Project, and of course, your attorney, Ms. Jane Hogan, is sitting next to you. Uh, in addition to that, uh, not speaking, is Kenny Leslie, Gregory Finney, and Shane Jackson. Uh, here in opposition, uh, uh, speaking will be uh, Mr. Bruce Deering, 22nd uh, uh, DA's office, uh, Desiree Etheridge, uh, Amanda Pitton, and Karen Etheridge. Also present but not speaking is Richard Etheridge, Joel Penton, David Adams, Karen Arias, Andrew Joyner with the 22nd DA's office, Renee Abair with the 22nd uh, DA's office, and Mr. Marty White, who is with the Attorney General's office. Uh, at after those people have had an opportunity to speak, you'll have an opportunity to address the board. And then once you've done that, Ms. Hogan will wrap up and the board will vote. Do you understand our procedures? Sir. Yes, sir. This is the matter of David G. Berry, DOC number 378050. Mr. Berry's birthday is November, the, I mean, uh, June the 6th of 1960. Uh, he is currently serving a life sentence on the charges of first degree rape and aggravated crime against nature, having been sentenced on December the 6th of 1996. Is that information accurate, Mr. Barry? Yes, sir. Mr. Barry, your case has been assigned to Ms. Bonnie Jackson, which she will begin our interview process. Would you please answer any questions she might have? Yes, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Are you having any difficulty hearing me? It's breaking up a little bit, but I can make you out. All right. We've had trouble with the connection um, all day, really. So if you miss something, you can certainly let me know, and I'll restate the question, all right? Yes, all right Mr. Barry, you are 63 years old and you have been in prison for approximately 27 years, give or take. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. The victims uh, in this case were your two stepdaughters. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. How long had you been a part of their lives? How long had you been involved with their mom? How long were you their stepfather? Uh, probably uh, 11 years. Uh, so if they were maybe 14 or 15 at the time, You've been in their lives since they were quite young, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And so uh, in many respects, they may have considered you as their father or their father figure, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Now, I read your application statement that you made in your application, and there are some things in that application that concern me or the statement that you made uh, that concerns me. And I want to you know, talk to you about that right off the bat. You indicated that on August 2nd, 1995, you got drunk, passed out in front of the TV, and woke up the next morning in the same chair. Okay. Yes, and then you said two days later, you and your wife were in a heated argument and that you were going to move out. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And then you said 
within an hour, she and my stepdaughters accused me of sexually assaulting them on the night of August 2nd, 1995. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And then you go on to say that you have no independent memory of that night or your actions, but you accept responsibility that you are legally guilty of these crimes because you were convicted by a jury, uh, all stemming from the night of August 2nd, 1995. I'm going to tell you a couple of things that concern me about your statement, um, Mr. Barry. The actions that you took towards those two girls took place over a pretty extended period of time that evening. And so it's somewhat hard for me to believe that you would totally black out any recollection of something that was a very long encounter over a pretty significant period of time. The other thing that concerns me is that although you claim to accept responsibility because you were found guilty of the crimes, your initial statement seems to suggest to me that you are actually saying that because you and your wife were in a heated argument, you told her you were going to move out, and then within an hour, she and my stepdaughters accused me of sexually assaulting them, which seems to me to be you're saying she was upset because I told them, told her I was moving out. And it suggests that she and her stepdaughters got together and concocted this story. That's what it sounds like when you say you all had gotten into a heated argument and within, out, within an hour of telling them you were moving out, then this allegation comes up. So that suggests to me, Mr. Berry, that you are not actually accepting responsibility for your actions. Would you care to speak to that? Ma'am, I, I wrote that because that is what I remember happening. The, uh, the night of the incident, I remember nothing about that night. Uh, the, uh, but I sat through trial and I know what was said and I... I accept responsibility for what was said. I, I own that. Uh, I believe I believe them. Uh, I just don't recall it. That's that's the only thing is I don't recall any of it. Uh, why, why would you? Why was it important for you then uh, to get into the heated argument? Told her I was going to move out. And then within an hour, she and my stepdaughters accused me of sexually assaulting them. That says to me, certainly, this was all, you know, a result of your saying you were moving out and it's just an accusation. That's what it sounds like to me. Okay? That, is, that was not my intention. So tell me about this extensive uh, use of drugs or alcohol that would cause you to not remember something as uh, involved as what happened with these girls. So tell, tell us about your substance abuse history. When did it start? Uh, and just tell us about it. Well, I mean, I can go back as far as when I was 13, 14 years old, I started drinking. Uh, it didn't really become a serious problem until I got older. Um, older. Ma'am? How much older? Um, probably late 20s, mid 20s, mid to late 20s. 
it started becoming a problem. Uh, the uh, I can remember times that uh, one time in particular that I talk about is I, I went out drinking, uh, woke up in my truck sitting in my driveway. Uh, don't remember how I got home or how I got there. Um, and people the next day telling me about things that I had done and uh, different events that took place. And, and I, I don't recall any of it. One of them was uh, I won a tournament in a ballroom and, a, and that was quite a celebration afterwards. I don't remember any of that. Uh, they, uh, I can't explain the blackouts. Uh, I know they happened from time to time. I can probably think of five times in my life that I had blackouts that I don't recall any of the events that took place. Uh, nothing ever happened in any other blackouts to this severity. Uh, they, uh, but I do remember several times having blackouts. Why, why did your, I mean, were you using drugs and alcohol during that period of your life? Ma'am, you broke up. I didn't hear your question. And alcohol. Were you using both drugs and alcohol starting yes. in the late 20s? Yes, ma'am. And how and why did it escalate? Yes, ma'am. How and why did your uh, substance abuse issues escalate? Well, I... Uh, my wife and I owned a business together and we worked together all day and we were together all night. Over the years, uh, we started having marital problems. Um, my answer that I was taught about my growing up was go drink. So I went and drank. I started staying away from home and going to drink, um, which just escalated the problem even worse. Uh, the, uh, There was a, a lot going on with the business. When we started having marital problems, uh, I went to move out of the house. I stayed out drinking all the time, which was irresponsible, I understand, but that's that happened. And I'm, I'm here to face that. That did what about, happen. What about drug use? What kind of drugs were you using? Um, I started using cocaine probably in... probably the 90s or about 90. Um, I was in business for myself. Somebody, I was telling people about how tired I was. Somebody told me, uh, if you stored a little bit of this, it'll keep you going. Uh, at first I was resistant and then I tried it and it kept me going. And the next thing I know, I was using it to keep going, to stay awake. Uh, now, since I was a kid, say, 13 and 14, I always smoked marijuana, but, uh, but the real drug was the cocaine and it, um, uh, it just took over. And we'll get back to how you have addressed your substance abuse issues, but I want to go back to, uh, when your then wife went to the business to confront you with the allegations that the girls had made against you. Tell us what happened when she uh, showed up at the office. Well, I was getting ready to leave. Uh, my wife and I had had an argument earlier and I I used to go ride in the country. I'm from Tennessee. I'm from Nashville. So they had a place in Mississippi, which is right there by Slidell, that I used to go ride in the country, reminding me of Tennessee. So I'm getting ready to leave the office to go take a ride. That's where I used to go to clear my head. I'm getting, I'm leaving the office to get ready to take a ride. Um, my friend comes in and he tells me about this. I blew it off. I said, that's nonsense. Uh, we'll straighten it out when I get back. And I just went and took a ride. Was, well, before you went and took the ride, wasn't there an incident where there was a gun involved? Well, yes, ma'am. I carried a gun everywhere I went because I, 
Well, I understand. Uh, I dealt with a lot of cash money and things like that. But I said, was there an incident where when your wife confronted you about what her girls had said, that you produced the gun? I don't recall that, ma'am, but I'm, I'm not going to say it didn't happen. It was kind of a crazy period right there. I'm not going to say absolutely it didn't happen, but I don't recall that happening. Well, what are the what were the circumstances surrounding your actual arrest by law enforcement? So while I was out, while I was out riding, uh, I had called my wife on the phone and found out about the allegations. I pulled into a rest area and a car pulled in front of me in the rest area, pulled up a plain white car, pulled up in front of me. A guy got out with a, a, a flannel shirt on. I had the gun laying on the dash. I reached up, took the gun off the dash. And uh, next thing I know, I was surrounded by the cops. Well, I was talking to my wife on the phone. I looked around. There was two cars behind me. There were, the guy in the front of me that originally stopped ended up being a sheriff's deputy. I didn't know that at the time, but then um, they told me to put the gun down. I put the gun down. I told him I wanted to talk to somebody. One of the detectives walked over to the truck and we had a conversation. And uh, I went to reach inside the truck to get something to show him. They wrestled me to the ground and arrested me. Now, uh, you've, you've provided us an extensive list of programs and certifications that you have received over the last 27 years. Uh, most of what you have provided for us either are vocational skills, and certifications and certificates relating to your work as the uh, inmate counsel. Uh, but I don't see a lot of programming that you've taken that would address some of your personal issues, some of the problems that brought you here uh, that needed to be worked on. For instance, I only see uh, living in balance. Uh, and I'm, did you take both parts of living in balance or just living in balance one? I took both phases of it, ma'am. And how long ago was that? I want to say they were 16 weeks. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how long it was. Um, now how long ago did you participate in living so in balance? I would have to look at my notes. I don't really remember the date. 2018. 2018. No, that, no, that's living in balance. Oh, that's living in balance. Um, so it's a I want to say it was around 2015 or 16. And yes, and I've got, I've got a I've got a date here uh showing where he finished that November 10th of 2016. 2016. Okay. Um, so what what did you learn in living in balance? Well, one of the main things I learned is what the triggers are that cause you to drink. I learned how to deal with those uh, what triggers. Were, what were your triggers? Stress. Okay. Any particular kind of stress because you know life on planet Earth is stressful. Yes, ma'am. I understand. The uh, it was just when things would get 
Um, I, I really dislike using the word overwhelming, but when things would just get piled up, it was a way of doing things. I would drink to kind of release for a little while, kind of like a reset valve. And then I would come back the next day and conquer the, whatever the problems were that was that I thought was too much that day. I just, it would be like a reset valve. Is living in balance the only substance abuse treatment or substance abuse program you participated in? No, ma'am. I've been I've been a part of AA sober groups as uh, probably uh, when I first got here. The first year I've been participating in that. Uh, matter of fact, my sponsor is now the president of the sober uh, AA group up here now, uh, and I I confer with him almost on a daily basis to uh, maintain my sobriety. As of today, I have 24 years and nine months sober. Uh, congratulations on that. Um, Thank you, ma'am. Most, most of your time incarcerated, and, and you have participated in some, some valuable activities. Um, you've been at the law library for 20 years. You're the coordinator of the main prison library. You're a senior offender counsel. Uh, you are an instructor for the inmate substitute counsel uh, training program, and you are the founding president and founding member of the reentry club. And all of those things are, are, are good uh, things to have been involved in. But again, as I look at your record, you only enrolled in sex offender treatment uh, in May of this year. Given Ma I've been... Go ahead, I'm sorry. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Uh, I enrolled in... All I can go by is the documentation that's in the file and sex offender phase one is from May of 2023. And that, that is correct. But I originally signed up for the program in 2002. I have been backlogged for the program since 2002. When I, when I went to Hunt in 17, I tried to get in the program over there and their program was full. So I had worked with a social worker over there because I wanted to learn learn as best I could about the program. So uh, Miss Lexi over there, that's the only name I know by, she worked with me on the program to help me to learn the steps and try to learn some things about the program. When I came back here in 2018, uh, uh, I pushed again for the program and I pushed and I pushed. And finally, this past, this year, they let me know that I would was be in the class and I've not missed the class. But again, I, I, we've seen a lot of offenders serving time for sex offenses, and they haven't had that kind of issue getting into sex offender treatment. And given the nature of your offenses, it's just kind of hard for me to believe that you would have been backlogged since 2004 when you're serving time for aggravated rape and aggravated crime against nature. I just have not experienced other inmates having those charges, having the issues that you report with getting into sex offender treatment. That just seems very unusual. I'll just say that. When did you take victim awareness? Uh, I took victim awareness, I want to say, in 19. It may have been 20. I graduated in November of 2022. So it had to be 21 that I started. Okay. And again, was there any reason that you did not start that program earlier? Well... 
there's no justifiable reason. I should have done it sooner, but I've been involved in so many programs. I try not to overburden myself with too many programs, but I want to take the programs that I feel like will benefit me and make me help me to be a better person and understand why this crime happened and why my choices were bad. Let me ask you this. If you were prioritizing things in your life that you needed to work on, I would think sex offended treatment would be like right there at the top as opposed to, uh, you know, substitute counsel, uh, you know, certifications for, I mean, I, I, you know, I would have thought that your first priority would have been getting into sex offender treatment and victim awareness and things like that to help you get a grasp and an understanding of how you were able to commit these crimes against your, your stepdaughter. Yes, ma'am. I I, under, I understand what your your perspective and uh, and but it was it was not since I've been incarcerated. I've tried to do things to further myself and to better understand myself. But in the process, I'm also about giving back to the community and trying to help as much as I can. I can't make amends to the victims. Uh, the law forbids that. And I and I haven't tried, um, but by giving back to the people here and the community here, I make some kind of amends, some kind of way, uh, be it as minor as majors. But I've contributed a lot to the population here, and try to do things here that was in a positive nature. Uh, yeah, I could have I could have went and right off the bat and did all of these programs and just crammed them in. But I always have looked at any kind of learning experience as something that you take and you let it digest and you let it sink in and you have to absorb it and really live it before you be ready for the next program. So, uh, yeah, victim awareness is something that I waited for. Uh, 2017, 18. I Let's just talk about victim awareness. Tell me, tell me what did you learn and absorb from victim awareness? Well, one of the main things that I absorbed is how many victims I've caused. I mean, I never really thought about the extent of the victims. Uh, I learned about the hurt that I caused, uh, the things that happened. Talk that, about uh, it. Talk about it. I don't want to hear what you learned about it. I want to know what you learned. What what? I learned the the extent of the pain that I caused. Oh. Well, what is the extent of the pain? That was the main thing. Uh, a very extensive. Uh, the uh, I mean, I don't I don't know exactly how to answer that question. You were in victim awareness. You should know how to answer that question because it should have put you in the shoes of those uh, young girls who look to you as a father figure. Uh, and I don't know why you even need a class to, to, to think about how devastating that had to be for those girls. So I just want you to articulate for me specific ways you know and understand that your actions affected those young ladies' lives. And I don't want to get into the specifics of what they say happened to them because it's terrible. It's horrific. But given what happened to them, how do you think that's impacted their lives? To have somebody they viewed as a father figure to do to them, even if you say you don't remember, 
You heard about it at the trial. How do you think that impacted those girls and how they turned out today? Well, ma'am, it impacted them dramatically, I'm sure. I mean, I destroyed their sense of stability, their sense of security, uh, uh, destroyed their sense of safety. They, uh, the emotional trauma they must have went through is just unimaginable. I can't imagine the extent of the trouble they went through. The, uh, the attention that this case had gotten through the media, uh, I wasn't worried about me. I was thinking about them and the things they must have been going through at that time. It was, a, a, I never intended anything to this uh, effect should never happen to anybody. The, uh, I know that now. I look, I, the, the impact this must have had on their lives, I just can't imagine uh, because they were both teenage girls. They were both uh, at the prime of their time at high school and they, uh, they were at a, had a, what was considered a decent family life. Uh, we lived in a nice neighborhood. They had a good school they went to and I shattered all of that. You, you have um, a lot of opposition, which you cannot control, but uh, the sheriff, the DA, the chief of police, uh, are opposed. Uh, both the victim and their mother um, are opposed. Um, and even your, you have a biological son? Yes, ma'am. In opposition? From him, ma his opposition from him and uh, his wife. And so there's a lot of opposition. Um, I do note that you've only had five disciplinary write-ups in the last 27 years, which is a really good disciplinary history. Uh, you had uh, contraband write-up in 2016 and 2017. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. What, what were the contraband? In those issues. In 2016, I was president of the reentry club. During a routine security shakedown, there was some uh, tobacco products found in there. And as the president of the club, I took responsibility for the cigarettes. That was the 2016 contraband. In 2017, the another time the shakedown crew doing a regular routine shakedown of the building, had went in there and they closed the building down for a few days. And then when they finally let us go back in, I, I found a cigarette lighter and a. they said it was a cigarette rolling machine. I didn't know what it was at the time, laying on the floor, but I picked it up and I put it in my desk drawer. They called me to the warden's office. I went to the warden's office. When I came back, uh, there was a security officer with it in her hand and that was the other contraband. And when I explained that it was just found on the floor, I, I took responsibility for it. I actually got shipped to hunt for it. Warden, what can you tell us about Mr. Barry? I'm looking back through his record, and, and I find back uh, January 26 of 2000, he was offered the uh, Professional Academy's Madison County Risk Management Model, which at the time was the Adult Sex Offender Treatment Program here. Um, he elected not to participate in the project at that time. That was January 26 of 2000. And then again, in October 16th of 2002, he was re-offered the same um, sex offender treatment program and again declined. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Thank you very much. Mr. Barry, would you like to 
Um, explain why you would tell the board that you were on backlog and you couldn't get in when in fact you on two separate occasions declined the opportunity to get into the program. Well, in 2002, after the second time I declined. Oh, well, uh, go back to the first time. Why did you decline it the first time? I still hadn't accepted responsibility. That's the only thing I can think of. I just, um, that's the only thing I can think of. I don't remember the exact reason why I declined, but I, I would say that was probably the reason. Uh, in 2002, when they asked me again, I declined, but I went back and asked to be put on the backlog for the class. That's when they put me on the backlog. Well, but you didn't tell us that. You acted as if you were trying to get in and you never offered the opportunity. You know, yeah, after they've given you two chances and you've turned it down, I would think they would move on to other people who were more willing to address the issue. It seems like you were, there was a lot of avoidance going on in how you have conducted yourself the things that you poured your attention into rather than the fact that you're here for raping your stepdaughters and, and not and not being willing to address everything that goes along with that. That's that's concerning, Mr. Barry. Your lack of candor is concerning. And the fact that you have not made a priority working on the two things, diction and a sex offense. Those are the two things that have you here. And yet those are the two things that you devoted the least amount of your time to. And that's concerning to me. Uh, Ms. Maribel, that, that's all I Thank you. Uh, well, we'll hear from uh, Mr. Kerry Myers. Yes, good afternoon. Kerry Myers of the Louisiana Parole Project. Uh, I can't speak to the to the David Berry who was convicted of, the, of, of those offenses. I can speak to the David Berry that, that I worked with, that I knew, uh, the one that uh, taught using his expertise, um, hundreds of, of of inmates, uh, skills that they needed in their lives. Uh, the David Berry that led and helped found the reentry club uh, that provided support for the court ordered uh, reentry program in Angola uh, and continues to do today. Uh, the David Berry who developed training programs for inmate councils uh, to improve that, uh, that area of the prison. Um, that's the David Berry I can speak to. Uh, the David Berry, who, uh, uh, again, who seemed to be always busy giving back to the community. Uh, should David get a recommendation today? Uh, while we know that he has a, a long-term housing plan um, through a, a group that, that um, works with veterans, David is an Air Force veteran, uh, honorably discharged. Um, we, will, uh, we will provide reentry support for him um, through our this, this this housing unit is in New Orleans. We have a, a reentry specialist uh, who works out of New Orleans. Will come at least uh, twice a week to during the initial uh, transition period to our office to participate in classes and programming, and then we'll continue to provide him uh, support beyond that. Uh, his disciplinary record, his contributions uh, are, are vast. Uh, his contributions are vast. His disciplinary record is excellent. And uh, that's the David Berry that, that I know. And that's the David Berry that, that I would just ask this board to consider. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Henderson, Mr. Norris Henderson. Uh, good afternoon. Yes, I'd like to echo what Kerry said about uh, David Berry that's sitting in front of us. I didn't know Barry David before he showed up. But David's role in the law library was my role in the law library. I was a librarian, so I understand fully how consumed you can get. One of the things that when David say his, his failure to accept things, 
one of my biggest challenges in the law library was as I read books, was finding cases torn out the books. The cases were really torn out the books that were primary guys were trying to hide what they had done. And so I remember in the early 2000s when this program came along for all the folks who had to register to take part in that program, nobody wanted to be a part of it primarily because we were gonna stigmatize them in front of the whole prison population. So a lot of guys kind of like shied away knowing they had to be a part of it, but because they were trying to build something inside the prison, they didn't want that to be the impediment to stop the relationship building with other folks. So this is not the first time I've seen this come up. This come up in the past and just like Warden Felgo went into the record and pulled up that, voila, the guy denied. He wouldn't accept the program. And in the early concept of this program, that's how people responded to it. Nobody wanted to be seen as chest of the molester. You know, that's how negative this thing was inside that environment. But David's contribution to everybody in that environment, the library provides hope to other people. Reentry provides hope to other people. So it wasn't self-serving that David was doing all this other stuff. So I would ask the board to look at, juxtapose that. I know this is a, 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 a real serious situation that uh, we're dealing with, but I think if we look at his service to humanity, you know, all the other things, all the people you've helped build skills with, that he has done something real meaningful with the time that he's actually been locked up. And I would definitely ask this board to please make a recommendation because it's folks like David that kind of like opened the doors for other people to be able to step through. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Henderson. Uh, Mr. Bobby Wallace. Yes, my name is Bobby Wallace and I'll I've been I've been incarcerated at Angola for 22 years plus, and Mr. Barry and I we are friends. And there are several occasions that I've seen and not only experienced his goodness. Mr. Barry and I will be sitting in the office and we'll be talking about things that are are positive. We're trying to go over how we can help the people that are around me. And when he was in the re-entry and it started all that, I saw him helping one person after another. I can only vouch for the person that I know, that I've lived around, and the character that he developed into and what he really is. And I know that Mr. Barry would be an asset and not a liability. And whatever it is that I can do to make sure that his transition, if blessed, to get a favorable response, I would be there for him. Thank you very much, Watts. We appreciate your comments. Now we'll hear from the opposition. Uh, Ms. Karen Etheridge. Good afternoon, Ms. Etheridge. How are you? Thank you. Um, uh, you know, the applicant's my former husband, the stepfather of the victims, Desmond and Amanda. We married when my daughters were four and five. At that time, he promised to love and protect them. For many years, they just considered him and called him their daddy. Their biological father was a deputy in the parish. He died of a heart attack when they were 10 and 11. My daughters were just 14 and 15 when they were brutally raped at night point in our own home by this despicable person. For him to violate their trust and bodies in such a horrific manner is unforgivable and should be unpardoned. In 1996, at the end of a difficult trial, he was sentenced to three life sentences plus 60 years for aggravated rape and aggravating crimes against, against nature. His sentence was without benefit of probation, parole, or commutation sentence. And yet we're now here for consideration just that. When the trial ended, David's stepfather, Marlon Dufresne, told my father that you're a better man than I am. I would have killed him. He also said that he had never trusted her around his three daughters, David's stepsisters. My father had every intention of being here to repeat these statements himself, 
Sadly, my father passed away in July. Oh. My mother has also passed away. David's actions that night clothed my mother. She was never the same after learning what he had done to her granddaughters. She had multiple strokes, which was ultimately the cause of the death. <clears throat> my husband and I are both military veterans. We've served our country proudly and believe in the laws of our state and our nation. We're having difficulty accepting that a person can commit these horrendous crimes, serve just part of the sentence, and then be considered for release without serving the sentence he was duly and lawfully given. I now have two 12-year-old granddaughters, one of whom has life-threatening medical issues and physical disabilities. She would have no way to protect herself or potentially escape from David would he come after her. While I do believe that some people are capable of reform and deserve a second chance, there's nothing society can gain from releasing this person from prison to potentially inflict harm on another innocent woman. He has no regard for others or the rule of law. He's proven that he feels laws simply do not apply to him. I implore you to deny his petition and keep the sexual predator behind bars where other people remain safe. And I want to remind you that this is the girls we're talking about, not the 42 and 43 year old women that are sitting here. It's this 14 and 15 year old girls that we had friends. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Mickey. Now we're here from uh, Miss Amanda Pitton. Desiree wants to go first. I'm yeah. sorry. Desiree sure. Wants okay. To go uh, Miss Desiree? When I was 15 years old, I begged my daddy not to touch me. I begged him to know with tears not to hurt me. I had to plead with my daddy not to touch my little sister. Please, daddy, go. When I was only 15 years old, my daddy raped me and threatened to kill my mother and my sister if I didn't shut up. When I was only 15, I was forced to wake my little sister and cry and apologize that now I will be raping her as well. I don't have to tell you that we were terrified and confused. I don't have to tell you about how our little bodies were abused where our trust was broken in those hours. Even after the trial, I felt like a victim, ashamed, disgusted, and terrified. I had problems in relationships, mentally, spiritually, problems with alcohol for many years. After years of hard work and lots of help from God, I became a survivor instead. I've helped other victims that I've come in contact with become survivors. I've become strong and never again silent. I haven't thought about David Barry in well over 20 years until a few months ago when I got a call to write a letter. Then I got another call to write another letter, victim impact statement. Then again, another call and felt compelled to appear today in person. The monster that pleads to you doesn't deserve compassion. We do. He doesn't deserve joy. We do. He doesn't deserve my forgiveness for his violence and his evil. He deserves to rot where he sits until he dies. What I feel I do have to tell you is that up until a few months ago, I could sleep peacefully at night, not afraid. The nightmares have returned, but it's no longer myself in those nightmares or my little sister. Now it's my little nieces, crying, defenseless, the rest of this morning. I'm terrified for them. I'm terrified of what he will do if he's released, as everyone here should be, for your daughters, your neighbor's children, your pastor's little girl. 
David Barry is a monster and he doesn't deserve to breathe free air among the rest of us. You all can help protect the rest of us before something atrocious happens again, rather than help be responsible for another trial because his evil will resurface. I'm smart enough to know that I am no longer in danger from that decrepit old man, but he is a danger to many little girls who cannot speak here today, nor should they have to parade before me to plead for him to sit and stay where he belongs. So I'm going to speak for him. Please do not allow this person to leave the prison he rightfully belongs inside. Here, out here, the rest of us are protected from his evil. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, I never thought I'd have to go through this again. Um, he was going to tell us he'd be reading the rest of his life. He died because he was never going to get out. Just put it away. And I did because why well, not have to worry about it again when I have to deal with it? And then when I see you with my daughter, when Chuck called me, my mom would call me to let me know that this was happening. It almost twelve, and she's the one with the pin cap. Can't walk, can't crawl. She would not be able to do anything. She's useless. I didn't see anything like that. Now, all these programs, he's starting to hurt himself. So when it gets to the point where, right now, he can boast about himself and talk about himself. Or something that could possibly help him in the future. That's why he started all this stuff. Why he became a lawyer in the reentry program. That's why. So he could help himself out. Not anybody else. And he did all these things in prison to help everybody else. Not a single victim. Just helping other inmates do things. If he was truly sorry about what he did, he would have not done this and tried to this all over again. He would not. He would have realized that the pain that he put us through once has put him through again. And then I found out that in three years he can do the same thing. And in seven and so forth, he used to bring us back here to do this. And that's not fair. Because we were told that that was it, that, that he was not getting out. We were safe. We did what we did. We went up there and told everybody what happened. We were scared. I was scared. I was really scared because he was in the room. They said that he never did that. Never had to worry about it. Many people are worried about it. Man. It's not fair. He was saying this for a long time. I don't want to say why he did it. I don't want to say why he's not being of hell, why he's not there to stay in there. Just every time we're gonna to have to come back here to do it. It's gonna be this all over again. We're gonna be traumatized every couple of years when he decides. He wants to do this, and it puts him in control of our lives. Still, he can control us. Now, when he's going to hurt us, how we're going to feel, and it's just going to make him feel better. But he is, he's still in control now. He wasn't for 30 years. He wasn't. We were happy. We were fine. Just, I take a lot of medication for depression, but not for being, my medication was like one time a day. I mean, I am to the point in the last few years, just, it's great. And like my sister said, I can sleep well. I can sleep fine. Have my family with me. Felt safe. No, no. Not me. Thank you very much. Uh, now we'll hear from Mr. Bruce Deering. First of all, uh, thank you all for this opportunity uh, to address all of uh, I've been prosecutor for 32 years. I focused on violent opinion for the majority of that career. I have in excess of uh, 100 uh, offenders that are doing life sentences. This is the first time I felt compelled to make a personal appearance in front of you this board. Uh, that is how I feel about this offender. Uh, there have been other offenders that I prosecuted that have come before this board that I uh, felt had genuinely 
rehabilitated themselves and were worthy of consideration. And I, and I did not involve myself in that process. I did not stand in their way. In fact, uh, there were times where this board granted the relief that they saw, and I was perfectly content with this. What sets this man apart from the other hundreds of violent offenders that I dealt with is the, the depravity of this crime uh, is, is unique. Uh, I can only think of other, two other sexual assault cases that I would even consider putting in the same category as his, and those were rapists that chose women at random on the streets to violently sexually assault. This man chose two adolescent girls whose biological father had passed away. They viewed him as their father figure. And he, he tries to convince you that this was done in a drunken stupor that he has no recollection of it. And I, you, there's some details in, in the crime that I just want to perhaps refresh your memory that clearly demonstrate that he was, that this was clear, this was deliberate, pre, premeditated, very calculated uh, in his crimes. He chose the middle of the night while he knew his wife would be asleep in bed. He chose a knife, which is a silent weapon, to, cut, to, to force their compliance. He closed the bedroom door to, to he and his wife's bedroom, which was not their, their, their habit. He turned the thermostat from automatic to on, on the fan, so the fan would never kick off. It would create that, that background noise that would drown out any of, of, of what the crime he was committing. He knew what time his wife was going to wake up that morning to, to prepare for work, so he, he interrupted the sexual assault, sent the girls to their bedroom, waited for the wife to wake up, prepare for work, and leave, and had one daughter go outside the house to confirm that, that she had left before he resumed his sexual assaults. Another detail of this crime that I've never seen in any other crime that I've prosecuted is in addition to sexually assaulting them by vaginally raping them uh, and, and forcing them to perform sex on him, he made each of those girls lick his anus. And I think that is a clear indication of how depraved his crime was. He, he dehumanized them. Uh, he, he, he basically treated them like property. And it was to get back. He knew that if, if he committed these crimes against their mother, who had, that's where he, his anger was with her because she was about uh, to, to end this marriage. He knew that, she, that he could inflict more pain on her by doing this to his two daughters than doing it to her. Uh, so this was a very calculated crime. Uh, I think it's telling uh, that during the very emotional testimony of, of his two victims, he sat there uh, unmoved by their, their testimonies. That was the individual, that was the same David Barry that sat in the courtroom back in 1996 during the trial, unmoved by any of the testimony. The depraved David Barry that committed this crime on August 2nd, 1995, is the same depraved David Barry that sat in the courtroom in 1996, the same depraved David Barry that we see there. He has not changed. Uh, you would think at 27 years of incarceration, he would have done what was necessary to address the sex offender mentality. He did nothing for 26 of those years, and only after Mr. Roche put on the form that as a minimal requirement for having this petition entertained, that he would have to do the four phases of sex offender treatment, that was told to him over four months ago. And here we are, four months later, he's done one phase. And only that, I think that is so telling that this, this individual uh, remains the danger he exists in 1995, and society is not safe with him being back, a member of of that free society again, and, and I hope that you would uh, reach that conclusion and deny this, this application. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Deering. Um, Mr. Uh, Barry, is there anything you'd like to say before we turn it over to Ms. Hogan? Well, first off, I, I would like to say that the person that they're speaking of is the person I was then. The programs that I have taken, the things I have done, has all been to better myself, to learn what I what I needed to know, to make sure that these kind of things would never happen again. Uh, as I said, I've 
I've got 20, 24 years and nine months without any alcohol or drugs. Uh, I have focused on nothing but giving back to my community. Uh, yes, the um, sex offender class, I did turn it down the first two times. It was not my intent to be deceptive by not mentioning that. I was just mentioning that I've been backlogged since 2002. The, I'm a different person. I'm not that person that they're speaking of. I understand what they're saying. That person right there, I agree with them. That person should never be back to life. But I'm not that person anymore. I'm, I'm different. You heard testimony from some of my supporting people that will tell you I'm not that person anymore. Uh, I don't like that person I was then. That's why I've taken so much programming and tried to learn so much. The, uh, I just want to thank the board for giving me the opportunity to come before you. Thank you, sir. Ms. Hogan? Um, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Maribel. Uh, there were some things that were said that I would just like to sort of clarify a little bit. There, there was something that we um, included in the packet that we filed for Mr. Barry that notes that he was backlogged after he denied risk management, uh, after he refused the treatment, he was backlogged for it since 2002. So there is proof of that in the packet that I submitted. Um, Mr. Barry has prioritized the issues which led to his incarceration. He's very nervous today, but he, in addition to AA and living in balance, he participated in the new men program. There's a letter in his packet from his AA sponsor that notes that he's met with Mr. Barry for over 20 years. Mr. Barry himself has sponsored other men seeking to achieve sobriety. Um, Mr. Barry's institutional record is absolutely phenomenal. He hasn't just improved himself. He has created he has created programs and, and systems within the institution that benefit hundreds, if not thousands of other people. Um, he started the reentry program. He was a founding member. He was a founding mentor. He worked so much with the um, law library and, and council substitute standards. He created standards that are across the board and greatly increased, uh, heightened the level of representation that people were getting from council substitutes. Um, whenever he went to hunt for two years, he saw that there was a need there for programming. So he started the transition program at hunt, um, which is similar to the reentry program, teaching vocational trades and giving sort of wraparound mentorship services to other, other offenders. Um, Mr. Barry, I didn't mention he's a member of the point lookout team he's a cpr he's cpr certified and on the on cpr team he um he's the president of the incarcerated vets through that he's performs days of service not just to benefit other incarcerated veterans but to benefit anybody he helps to fund raise to provide packages and and other packages to any any offender who's in need of of fi financial assistance um, so Mr. Barry has prioritized the things that led to his incarceration. Um, if he is granted release, he has he has the full support of the parole project. He also has other uh, he has the veterans outreach uh, people out of New Orleans that I've spoken to who are excited to provide him with housing should he be released. Um, so I would encourage the board to look beyond obviously what happened. 27 years ago is unchangeable um, to the extent that Mr. Barry seemed uh, insincere in what he wrote in his application. I would like to state that I actually helped me. I, I, those might have been my own words um, for I, I was um, representing Mr. Barry when he applied for clemency. And so I, I was the one that typed up his, his application for him to sign. So I would hope that that wouldn't be held against him. Um, Mr. Barry in every single meeting that I've ever had with him has shown me extreme remorse um, for what led to his incarceration. And he is also a low risk of recidivism. He's taken every program that he possibly could as it became available. And I think that his, the profound amount of, of good that he is, he's given to, back to the community, I think is really a testament to who he is today, that he, his rehabilitation is genuine and that he is worthy of, uh, of a second chance. And so I'd ask the board to grant his commutation uh, request to a term of years. 
Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Helgen. Moderator, on the Yes. <clears throat> Jack? Mr. Barry, uh, I will acknowledge that you have a, an exemplary disciplinary record and that you've done a number of good things during the course of your incarceration. Unfortunately, you haven't chosen to work on the things that are most important. I'm concerned that you're, you lacked candor. I mean, you, you know, when you say you were on backlog, and I'm telling you that I know that inmates get to get in these programs, you didn't say, well, I was off with them and I refused. You made it seem as if you just didn't have the opportunity to get into those programs, which is basically to be dishonest. And honesty is one of the things that really, really, really matter in these proceedings. The other is acceptance of responsibility. You claim, and when we heard just how long this incident, the number of hours over which this incident transpired, and the deliberate nature of every step you took clearly indicates that you were well aware of what you were doing and that there is no way on the face of this earth that you don't remember what you did to those goals and your failure to accept full responsibility for the horrible things that you did only serves to further traumatize them and to discount them uh, and what you put them through. And so because of your lack of candor, because of your failure to take responsibility, your failure to take necessary rehabilitative programs, and the adamant opposition from the victims in this case, my vote today is to deny your application for a commutation. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Mr. Freeman? Okay. Uh... Mr. Barry, I'm not going to say what Ms. Jackson said all over again, but uh, I can guarantee you were totally not honest with this panel today. Uh, and, you know, they talk about you're a changed person and you're not that same person. The problem I have is the crime you committed. You hadn't done enough time. I mean, come on. I mean, what you did was just, just unthinkable. So my vote is, I uh, also want to thank the victims for showing up. It took a lot of courage, and uh, we appreciate it. Also, the district attorney's office. Uh, my vote today is to deny. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. Mr. Rusha. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I'd like to thank the victims and the victims' family, especially the uh, 22nd JDC district attorney's office and the attorney general's office for their appearance today. Mr. Barry, you're not ready. You hadn't even accepted responsibility at this minute. On January 9th, on January 9th, 2023, I reviewed your application. Because of all the good things you've done and things, I want to give you a chance. But I made a note on the vote sheet, offender must complete all four phases of his sex offender treatment before this hearing. When that word got back to you, and eventually to Mrs. Hogan, Mrs. Hogan urged you you tried to enroll in the sex offender treatment. And I think you eventually enrolled in April of May 
and you're still in the first phase. If I would not have made that notation, you still wouldn't be in sex offender treatment. The only reason that you're in sex offender treatment is that you want to get out. You still have not accepted responsibility for the horrendous pain and suffering you put your stepdaughters through. So based on the nature of the offenses, based on express opposition from the 22nd JDC, District Attorney's Office, the State Attorney General's Office, the adamant opposition from the two victims, opposition from the victim's family, opposition from law enforcement. Mr. Berry, you are no where ready to be released. You are a predator and you are a danger to society. <laughs> I vote this to be not. Thank you, Mr. Russia. I'd like to thank the victims to be here today. It's important that you speak up and bring your voice to us. Um, uh, my vote likewise is the same to me now for all of you. I could go on for 20 minutes, but I'm not. My, my colleagues have put it very succinctly uh, why you're not being granted to the case. We've got four votes to deny. Your uh, commutation request has been denied. Good luck to you.